All right, so, uh, oh no, fail. There we go, all right. The tubes are clogged. All right, so about myself, um, my name is Garrett Eastem. I'm the uh, founder and chief data scientist at a company here in town called Edgecase. Uh, quick plug on us, we work with large retailers to do product data enrichment. So what that means is we take uh, ugly, non-normalized, dirty, retail catalogs that all these retailers like uh, Pier 1 or Crate and Barrel have, uh, and we essentially run them through a combination of machine and human um, uh, workforce that lets us normalize and enrich it with information that's more relevant for how customers might want to actually shop on a website online. And then we pass that data back to them and they can ingest that into their search engine, their you know, product information management tool, um, put that back into their personalization engines. Uh, a lot of things, it turns out, in the e-commerce world run a lot smoother when you have clean, structured data. Uh, and that's about all I'll talk about there. If you want to have more questions about Edge Case, happy to um, talk about that later. Uh, so about myself, uh, I tend to focus on uh, AI and e-commerce, given kind of my history. Um, you know, before I did a CS at Stanford for undergrad, uh, I've done a lot of web analytics in my career over the past six, seven years. Um, so, you know, back in, uh, you know, well, before Edge Case, I was at a company called Bizarre Voice, and actually I see some of the Bizarre Voice folks in the back there, uh, where I was uh, helped kind of get the, the big data team off the ground uh, with a small project called Magpie that was their analytics engine. And then even way before that, I did a little bit of work with a company called, at the time, Whale Shark Media, which was now, you know, Retail Me Not. Um, that was there before they had the Retail Me Not website. Uh, fun place, I can tell you some stories if you'd like. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly enough, most of my career has been in product management in one way or another. Uh, so BV product management, uh, product engineer, uh, and then as a founding uh, CEO for my company was very closely related to product and sales. Uh, and about the past year and a half, I've moved into a more pure R&D role as the chief data scientist. and. Uh, we can talk about that later, about what that means and how I think about that role. Uh, but what I'm really here to talk about today uh, is, as uh, Louise mentioned, my, uh, uh, my blog. Uh, and so the, the talk's going to go a little bit like this. So we're going to talk a little bit about framing data science problems. I'm going to introduce a, a framework that is not mine but borrowed called the Machine Learning Canvas. Uh, that I'm hoping that if you're a product manager in the room or if you're a data scientist in the room, you can give this tool to your product team and use it as a vehicle to facilitate conversation about how to build, how to bring AI or machine learning or whatever you call it into your own product lines and product features and roadmaps. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about recommendation science. Not so much on the math side, there's a little bit of um, math in there for, for the, the nerds in the room, but mostly it's gonna be talking about um, abstractions around uh, product affinities. Uh, and then we're gonna do a real simple example. Uh, again, I don't have my machine up. I'm gonna walk through source code, uh, mainly Skull and Spark, uh, about building a, a simple real-time movie recommendation experience uh, using a, an open data set called Movie Lens. Uh, is anyone in the room played with Movie Lens? Just show of hands. Three, four, five. There you go, excellent. Uh, and then we'll leave some Q&A at the end. Uh, should be hopefully about an hour, hour 15, and we can get you guys uh, to happy hour afterwards. So with that, come on, tubes. Uh, there we go. So. Uh, as you mentioned, I started a blog about two months ago called Data Exhaust. Uh, the URL is dataexhaust.io. Uh, the vision uh, is, oh man, latency issues. The vision has come out of uh, a lot of conversations that I've had over the past year and a half in my, my new role as a chief data scientist where I would talk with many leaders in the data science community here in Austin uh, about how they run their data teams, how they interface with product and sales, uh, and one of the things, kind of thinking with my product manager hat on, I kept seeing over and over is that there's a very large gap between how data scientists think about the world and how product managers think about the world. And they both want the same things, right? We both want to create uh, beautiful product, beautiful, intelligent product experiences. Um, the challenge is that these two sides of the table tend to think very differently. Uh, data scientists think more in terms of form and velocity of data. So what's its structure, you know, what's, uh, you know how, how do I store it, what do I do with it? And then product managers will think, as you would expect, more from 
a market standpoint. So what is a product opportunity? Um, can I turn uh, this AI thing I've been hearing about into a better, faster widget? Um, or can I open up a new revenue source? Or can I close a new deal? Um, or the other use case tends to be, for a lot of data science, honestly, uh, insights. Um, so a lot of data science today is coming out of the business analytics realm, where uh, 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 analysts are kind of taking on more intelligent model development. Uh, and they're really kind of being seeded from questions from the kind of age-old uh, analyst viewpoint. Um, and so, you know, kind of the what today's talk is going to focus on is we're going to use the the lens of product recommendation as a uh, hopefully an example to help understand how you might bring uh, a common uh, problem you might have in your own business to a product manager or a data scientist and collaborate together. Uh, and so we're going to do this by introducing a framework called. Oh, do I get there? Um, so let's kind of think from a data scientist standpoint first. So uh, a data scientist that's trying to think of how to build a better product recommendation engine. So the, the previous slide there I forgot to mention is that, you know, if you think about uh, recommendation engines, we all probably think about Amazon.com, right? Uh, the what products you know, other people bought or what items other people viewed. Uh, and there's a stat on there that I think I pulled that you know, they've claimed that recommendation engines account for up to 35% or something of Amazon's total sales, which is an incredible amount of money when you think about you know, just how much uh, volume is going through that website. But also there's a ton of other e-commerce sites out there. You know, there's thousands of e-commerce sites at all different kinds of scale. Uh, that need and could leverage uh, the recommendation science and making their recommendations better. Um, so if you were to come to your data scientist with this question, uh, that person you know, will think about it from, a, okay, recommendations can't be that hard, right? It's you know, given a user, uh, which may be defined and you know, featured in a variety of ways. Maybe you have a user that's represented by the um, pages they visited, the products they bought, um, the age and demographics that they represent. They're you know, 29, age male, living in Austin, Texas, right? Um, and then you want to solve a problem. Well, what's the max? What's their maximum preference for a set of products that I have? Uh, and just choose one, right? Can't be that difficult. Um, so that's how a data scientist would approach it. But when you think the same, pose the same problem to a product manager, they kind of come up short in terms of what what is the what's the best way to frame that dialogue, right? Uh, they might be thinking from a KPI standpoint. Maybe they're a product manager for the checkout process for an e-commerce cart. Maybe. Here at Visa, they're the product manager for um, you know, fraud, potentially, and they want to recommend better uh, cards to someone for based on their security risk. Um, and so they might have some a sense of the, the needle they're trying to move, but how do you structure a dialogue with a data scientist or a data team in such a way that you come out of that process with not just a, oh, we could go try this experiment or this might be useful, but an actual action plan that you can use to, uh, to structure product investment and activities. Um, so this abstraction, let me just make sure I got that, yes. Uh, the machine learning canvas, uh, this is from, uh, I think, a, a, a consultant's website, machinelearningcanvas.org. Um, and you know, it, I, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say the, the best vehicle or the only vehicle, but it is a, a vehicle that exists to kind of help structure these conversations. Um, and so has anyone in the room seen the business model canvas out of curiosity? Right, so this should be very familiar in terms of it's actually the same, pretty much the same exact setup, except uh, we're going to walk through kind of what these different pieces mean in the context of a couple of examples. And then we're going to see what the product recommendation engine might look against that. Um, so the first part that if you were as a data scientist or a product manager having a dialogue about recommendations, I'm just going to use the... So these first two parts are kind of what I call the core premise. Uh, so first and foremost, the most important conversation that uh, any data scientist and product manager need to have is around the value proposition. Uh, and again, product managers should be, because of their, their title and their focus, should be very familiar with how to cr uh, craft a compelling value proposition. Uh, sorry, you said, oh, louder, is that better? <laughs> They should be uh, familiar with how to craft a compelling value proposition. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the, the other thing is that typically this is going to be where a chief or director data scientist really needs to come in uh, at the beginning of a project to really sit down with the PM or product leader and say, what are the 
initiative you're trying to move? What are the uh, the needles you're trying to move? And kind of express that from a business value standpoint. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the companies that uh, I've been talking with here in town, uh, I'm not going to name the name, but they have a very large sales force, like many folks do. In their case, they have a very large kind of yellow pages style, you know, dollar for dollars, um, large room of folks kind of uh, 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 trying to hit quota uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and their problem can be expressed really most directly in terms of I want to improve the close rate of my salespeople. Um, and they can very directly say that if I improve the close rate on a daily or monthly or quarterly basis from 10% to 15%, it has this amount of value uh, in terms of uh, a total incremental revenue that I can drive for the business. And then they can probably also go further from there and say, actually, if I can improve it to this, you know, industry benchmark, I know that we're going to be the most competitive and we can win, uh, you know, a capital uh, at a much more efficient rate than other folks can, than other folks can right? Um, similar standpoint, another SaaS-based company here in town, uh, their business model is all about mining unstructured um, documents from uh, an industry uh, that has this is a bunch of kind of PDFs, basically. Um, very common, actually, oil and gas, medical. Uh, you'd be surprised how many of especially these old industries have just really unstructured text that um, professionals and um, uh, different folks have to use daily. Uh, what they do is they go through that large, you know, kind of a swath of uh, raw text and uh, information that comes out every day. And their goal is to essentially extract a very small piece of that information. Actually, of like a 100-page PDF, they just need to extract, you know, one tiny table of information that someone wrote up um, as like a, a surveyor or like a, a, an examiner, and they want to convert that into a data set that they can then turn around and sell to as a subscription service, basically. Um, now, they've built out a solution where they've done a lot of this by hand. So they got uh, kind of stay-at-home workers and a kind of mechanical less Turk or mechanical Turk Turk S style. Um, work wor uh, workforce where they give somebody the document, they read through, and they kind of convert it by hand. Uh, and they want to do something simple where just, I want to lower the cost of acquiring information, right? So the, uh, the value prop there is more from a, not from a revenue generating standpoint, but more from a um, cost saving standpoint. Um, so once you have a value prop, you then kind of move into, well, how do we, what, what is a model going to do for me? And so there's two kind of areas there. One is, what is the actual decision that a model is going to do for you. What is the, uh, and that's kind of where, you know, you start to blend a little bit more into what a PM might not be able to think, and more of like a data scientist might be thinking of. Well, you know, I, I get you're trying to move this needle. You need to kind of create this KPI or um, et cetera. And and really, decision is framed more from the what is the actual output of this model going to do, and how is that going to create value for your, or how is that going to serve your value proposition. So an example I gave about um, the company that's trying to increase close rate, um, the decision or the actual decision metric or where you might write that up from a business model standpoint or PM stand uh, framing standpoint uh, would be this model is going to predict a real valued number between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100 if you want to scale it of the likelihood of someone to convert every day. And we're going to use that to score um, uh, candidates or score uh, customers. And we're going to then give that to a salesperson. And the, the important part is you know, tiny details like understanding that that thing has to be calculated and delivered every day is very important because that can change just how, change how um, you build a model. It can change a lot of downstream effects. But also, more importantly, it's, it's very clear and articulate about how once that model is built and it serves that need, it's going to be plugged into the organization. And a product manager should have an easier time or is responsible for understanding how they're going to take that score and plug into that, that process. Um, and the other side, basically, is making predictions. How often does it have to make predictions? Does this model need to be uh, real time? Does it need to be batch based? Does it need to be um, uh, you know, served from certain places? Like A lot of tactical things about where that model plugs in um, uh, can really dictate how it gets operationalized. So, for example, um, you know, we're going to build a toy recommendation engine here, but if you were to go say, okay, now I need to drop that into my e-commerce site, uh, that might change the model you build. In particular, we're going to talk about offline and online computation and, you know, the need to do something in real time versus in a batch-based process and how that might change if you're a data scientist sitting down with this problem or this, really this spec, um, how you go and approach it. Um, so once you have those three things, like really the rest of this kind of starts to fall into place. I'll stop there real quick. Um, if any questions around those three, those things, any questions? Cool. 
So the next pieces are what I call the required resources uh, to generate or to, to fulfill the value proposition and the context with which you have to make recommendations or the model has to perform. Um, the first part is the ML task, and that's really, really kind of more in the domain of a data scientist, someone that's thinking or hopefully is thinking through the different kinds of models and algorithms that they're familiar with and trying to understand, okay, if I got a predict a real valued score, maybe I'm going to do a regression, uh, and it's not going to be you know, a one-hot coding, it's going to be an actual um, real valued number, right? Um, maybe the, the result is I'm going to do something with clustering, or I'm going to do something with um, finding the, most, uh, the, the features that have the most variance, for example. A lot of times, maybe you don't have to actually predict something. Your job is to actually just identify outliers or anomalies. Um, you know, so for like the, uh, let's say for the, uh, the company that's trying to score clients, for example, right, the ML task they have is scoring. And so they might build a very simple, uh, you know, set of classifiers that's not trying to pick one particular recommendation, but is trying to spit out a real valued number, right? Um, on the, uh, the company that's trying to extract uh, um, the kind of needle in the haystack from PDFs, their task might actually be generating a list of bounding box coordinates on a PDF, for example. So it's trying to think of the very constrained task, almost as if you were writing um, like a JIRA ticket, right, in terms of what is the requirements for the algorithm, because it starts to constrain the, the set of um, approaches and solutions you might, you might choose, right? Um, and then the next one down there is uh, offline evaluation. So that's, that's a pretty important part in terms of what is the training data you have to work with. Uh, so one portion is data sources, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the other piece is uh, how do I update the model? Actually, not even update it. How do I, how, what do I do to derive it? Am I working with, uh, uh, let's say, for in the example of um, the company trying to mine PDFs, they have a whole history of PDFs that are already marked up that uh, they can use uh, to, to, as a training source, basically. Uh, for the company that's trying to predict sales outcomes, uh, they have a whole history of um, uh, you know, Salesforce interactions uh, and Salesforce uh, successes and losses. Uh, and that's tied intimately with data sources. Um, again, they're all kind of tied together, but uh, one of the key things that once you start knowing how your model is going to be built, it also is informed very directly by the data you have available. Uh, so, in a, for example, in the recommendation engine scenario we're going to talk about in a second, uh, our data source is going to be reviews and what people uh, rate certain products by. Uh, then we're going to talk about other kinds of data sources. Uh, in the, uh, the scenario of the company that's trying to predict sales and close rate, their data source might be um, you know, uh, something as simple as how, how many days has it been since we talked to the customer last? Uh, what is the region or um, the, the last salesperson that they talked with? Uh, you know, and it could just be the abstract information uh, of what you have access to. And, and that can be important in a lot of ways. One is that oftentimes the way you choose to scale out and build your, your model is dictated really honestly by the data you have available and also the ability for you to get that data. Uh, a good example here is um, you know, at, at Edgecase, right? We uh, do a lot of work with uh, large-scale retailers and we measure uh, how customers navigate different websites. Um, and so a big part of whenever I would go to build a model, I need to understand first, how do I get the raw information that might be generated from, say, a pixel that might end up in S3 somewhere into an environment that uh, I can do, do work on, right? Uh, that's why a lot of folks in the Spark community love, love Spark because you can run uh, the same code locally as you can uh, in like a, a, a cluster environment on S3 logs. Uh, but if you're in an organization that doesn't have that luxury or you have data that's in silos, say it's, a, it's in an Oracle database over here and you want to go merge it with something that's in a bunch of raw CSVs over here, uh, you know, you have to do work or plan to do the work to go do that ETL and data munging, right? Um, a lot of folks, you'll hear this also referred to as data munging or data wrangling, and the, the joke is that data scientists spend 80% of their time or more just doing ETL work and trying to uh, clean data up. And that's true because the last part you're, you're responsible for is what are the features that you're going to parameterize your model by. Uh, and again, that's directly connected to your task you're trying to do, because if you have a... If you're going to build a, you know, a real value classifier using some chain neural networks, for example, you need to convert your features, whatever your data source has, into some you know, vector that you're going to pump into a neural network, right? Or maybe you're doing something simpler. You're doing you know, text mining, and you want to go build some hand-tuned hand, hand -tuned features on, on a text. Uh, let's say you have review content, and you want to build a, 
uh, sentiment classifier for a certain category of goods, uh, you might go through and look at the kind of keywords that are indicative or um, have a, a high correlation with you know high sentiment or low sentiment, and then use those as feature indicators in your your text once you want to go process that. Um, regardless, you know as you can as you think through that process and you're thinking about you sitting down with a product manager and hopefully your your data team. Um, this is the kind of conversations you want to have before you even do any kind of hands the keys kind of work. Uh, one, because it sets the scope for the project, right? Like you don't want to go uh, spend a bunch of time building a really fancy convolutional neural network to do some kind of you know classification if all of a sudden your data is not in a, in a, in a, in a format you can work with, basically, right? Uh, but in all cases, like this should drive a set of requirements that you can then have a more intelligible conversation uh, with your not only your product owner, but as that PM and that kind of product team is going to package up the whole initiative, everything from the resources required to uh, uh, deliver the product offering to the um, to the potential value it's going to it's going to uh, derive because they have to get go vent, go get resource and staffing for that right um, key things in terms of the re resources required the next piece just kind of rounding it out uh, is really comes into how do you oh yeah for sure for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, f the first thing is defining what you want to, what value you want to create, right? So the same way, like, that's, that's why this is like a, I guess, came out of the business model canvas, right? You always start with what value am I going to deliver to you as a customer? And is that worth the resources it costs me to go deliver that? And all the work I have to go do to actually operationalize that, right? Um, so assuming you have a task, a well-defined, I know that I want to go uh, score these candidates. And I think that I can move the needle from 10% to 20%. And... Um, you know, a product team in that company, for example, is probably very aware and has, a, I know for a fact, they're very, um, very conscious about trying to move that number. Um, they have a well-defined pain. A good chief data scientist or, or kind of um, the, the data science media management needs to be responsible for crafting that value prop into the first two pieces. And then from there, that can be, that can be technically data unseen. I mean, in a lot of cases, again, speaking from my, my own experience, uh, I know the data sources that I've worked with. Um, I don't have a large team. I'm a team of one. Uh, but if I had, say, five data scientists, I would know what each you know girl or guy is working on. I would know the kinds of data they run into. I probably also have known the kind of issues they've hit. So almost any example I've seen of teams I've talked to, they have have this ETL issue, right? They know the pain it takes to go get the data source from some other resource over here and imagine a company like Visa that's obviously, you know, that problem is magnified even more, right, when you have to go through layers of ownership and access, right? Uh, but you kind of know the general um, set of stuff you can look at, right? And that, in theory, should guide your dialogue, um, which is, you know, but it, it shouldn't be the end of that, right? In a lot of cases, you, you can come out of this process with a, um, with a what do we don't know? Uh, and that's kind of where you can go into the next phase uh, and you can do kind of exploration, right? So if you're running a, an agile development process, you might have your normal sprint cycle and your normal kind of product uh, iteration. In a lot of cases, um, you would, might want to peel off a separate, almost called a product discovery lane in a lot of cases, and have like a two or three sprints ahead of that process where you have either an engineer or it doesn't have to be a data scientist. It could be anyone that's just basically doing um, the, uh, the, explore, the exploratory work, right? Like I could see a lot of cases where you might have that first conversation, um, you all kind of put together a we think we can go do this, and then you break and say, the next sprint, we're going to do a couple of just research stories where the outcome is going to be, give me a sample data, give me a list of um, you know, models that might work for this, uh, and then help me understand some of the nuances of feature engineering around that, right? Um, I can see that, that working as well. Like, you wouldn't necessarily have to do all at once. Any questions? So the last part here is uh, really from operational standpoint. So I think in the, the business model canvas original, this is where it talks about um, you know channel partners and like how do you scale out your model. Um, in a machine learning standpoint, this is really the how do we go from the lab to production. Um, and I've seen a lot of examples where this can really fall, like really well-intended research initiatives can fall down because you haven't done the legwork up front to say, here's the explicit way that I want to plug in this model to this thing. Um, and, and we're going to, and once I do that, the customer experience around the results is going to be impacted this way. Uh, even before you get to the actual 
um, collecting data and operationalizing it, for example, right? I mean, a good case here is uh, in the um, con comparing and contrasting, say, the, the two examples I have. So one where you have the, uh, the company is trying to improve the close rate for, for a customer list, right? Uh, you know, they might have a, a whole system where they've already obfuscated away the scoring of customers and like the, the salesperson just sits down every day and they see a list of, um, you know, records to go call. Uh, versus, say, the uh, the PDF company where you're trying to extract a bunch of information from that PDF, and they have a whole workflow that's already in place to do this. If they automatically do that, that's disrupting that entire workflow. There's, all of a sudden, there's new politics around uh, <laughs> taking away folks' jobs, uh, changing how like the pipeline works. Um, a lot of things that are outside the realm of just engineering and data science that if you don't think through, can really and just kind of throw a horseshoe into the whole thing, basically. Um, but these last two thing, things are kind of more tactical. So collecting data, that's more just the, how do I scale the ETL? So again, as you think about the teams that start to build and scale these kinds of projects, a lot of work tends to come down to data engineering, right? So you have folks that are on the, the sprint cycle that'll get assigned to um, building and uh, 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 building up and kind of pu putting together a, a Spark job that's gonna be run to do the ETL from some warehouse over here. Or we know that we have to go get permissions and build the pipeline to do whatever processing over here. Uh, and that's just a whole set of just story work that has to get done. But it just still just generates requirements that you have to think through as you're thinking about the whole investment in like a, a, a intelligent initiative, right? Um, building model more tactical. Um, how does this model have to be built? Uh, what amount of information do I need to build it? Is it a nightly batch job? Is it an online algorithm? Um, how and where does that happen? A, a good scenario, actually one that's happening in a lot of cases today, is a lot of folks are using TensorFlow for uh, a lot of really cool neural network research and building some really interesting models in that world. But the reality is that it's a really still a pretty kind of terrible way to operationalize and scale those models. Or for example, you have an existing pipeline, say in Spark, or you have some other Python jobs that um, are already kind of humming along. How do you put into that process, you know, this very GPU intensive uh, model development and training initiative, right, which for example, with a, a, like a TensorFlow image thing could take weeks to process uh, when your batch job has to, you know, have a 24 hour SLA, for example, right? Um, those are some of the things you have to think through and, you know, what could happen in an example where you're um, your model building restraints say that it has to be built within a certain time period, it might actually throw out the entire capability of using something really cool like TensorFlow. You may just suddenly say, well, we have no, we can't possibly train a model in that time constraint. And so, you know, if we didn't think about that, we have to go back to the drawing board and like the task basically, right? Um, so all those things come together and they don't get talked about enough in conversations, um, but it's still important. And then the live evaluation and monitoring is a really critical piece. Um, so in a lot of cases, data science teams typically are, you know, at the own whim of figuring out if their model worked or not, right? Uh, and the really good organizations are the ones that both invest in data science teams and also support them with the, the resources to scale their work. Um, and so what I mean by this is tactically, typically the uh, data science teams are also having to figure out how to A-B test their models, right? But if they're not given the, the infrastructure resources or the data engineering team that can figure out how to go scale the analytics for testing a model or how it works, there's no way to know if your model works or not. Um, or another good example is that maybe the actual, the effect you need to see and measure may not correlate or have like a, a longer time frame than what you'd want, than, than your own process for iterating. So take, for example, the company that's trying to uh, scale or uh, increase the close rate for their uh, sales team they have to deal with the realities of that the impact they have on the close rate might follow the lead time for sales. It could be 15 to 30 days before they see the impact of a new model. Um, or like, you know, if it's an enterprise company, six or six months or, or to eight months for a larger deal. And so in those cases, if you have a, a complicated uh, evaluation process, you all want to think about the rollout process, not just from a yeah, we'll A-B test on the website, but maybe more of a, we're gonna do a series of iterations over you know, uh, 10 or 12 weeks, and we're gonna measure the results in you know, three months, and then we're gonna spend time coming back to it. And like, just thinking about how you actually think about, uh, you would change your um, evaluation development process. Any questions there before we dive into uh, an example of this against product recommendation engines? Cool. So here, again, like I promised, is a toy example of imagine you're Amazon and you're the product manager designing the what other people bought or other people like you might also like widget on the product page. 
Uh, and so in this case, the value prop is a pretty generic, well, I just want to show the user products that I might want. There might be maybe more nuance in terms of I have uh, certain objectives of conversion rate impact that I want to imp improve on this category, or uh, I want to see revenue increase. They might be structured that way, but fundamentally, uh, a recommender or a PM for a recommendation is probably going to say, I just want to show people stuff they like. Um, the decision that has to happen uh, is a real-time uh, recommendation on a product carousel, on a product uh, the PDP, which is uh, slang for product display page. So the when you get to an e-commerce site, the actual page that has the product on it um, has the reviews and description. But it also typically will have the the widget that gets loaded in in uh, uh, in real time. Um, that also is going to be constrained by how you make predictions. So the way that this model is going to be presented is on that product page. So the model has to select some products to go show to somebody. Uh, but it also is constrained by the fact that that page load can't load any slower than 50 milliseconds or some kind of time frame, right? Um, and then to the required resources, the task, as you're going to see here in a second, is really ranking um, or candidate scoring. So you know that you have 20 products, maybe because it's in the same category or uh, you have some selection of goods you want to choose a small set of. Uh, that problem is very directly a scoring issue. Um, you know, put give me a give me a real value number from zero to hundred on these you know 10 products, and I'm going to show the first three that have the highest score. Um, in terms of offline evaluation, we have historical user behavior. Uh, and the model we're going to build, we don't have a historical. We're going to look at um, what people have rated before. If I was uh, kind of doing this in real life, I would probably do uh, look at historical uh, page view information. Uh, but we'll kind of look at that in a second. Uh, and then the data sources, like I said, uh, we're going to start build a model with reviews. Um, and then we're going to do the online version with a, a modified click stream example, so just kind of uh, how to simulate uh, product affinities. Um, talk about that in a second. Uh, and then the features, again, we're going to talk about this model, but it's uh, 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 for most recommendation engines, or at least classical recommendation engines, uh, you typically see a user product affinity. Uh, and you know, I always kind of thought that was a, a funny word, but it's a, it does kind of cover a large number of um, abstractions over how someone feels about a product. Um, if you're a graph person, you know, it could be what's the, the connection strength in a graph, and you can define that in a variety of ways. Um, in this case, we're going to basically model what someone rated something. So an affinity is going to be if I gave it a one to five star review. Uh, and then the collecting of data, so in terms of the, how we update or how we make recommendations in real time, would be from a first party beacon or feed. So with reviews, I might get this data on a daily basis. So if you have a bizarre voice as a client or as a vendor, for example, maybe you take their feed every day and you pull it into your your Spark cluster and you rerun this model I'm about to show you and you kind of pump that back up to the production or put it into an A/B split, uh, and then building the model uh, nightly batch. And then we're going to show you. I don't I don't do an online um, uh, um, model update, but uh, there are algorithms out there that I can point you to if you if you're curious about that. Uh, and then if we were running the example I'm about to show you in a real life scenario, uh, because we have uh, a large website and because uh, typically these reviews are dynamically, uh, or these recommendations are dynamically painted on the page when the page renders, uh, the most simplest way for testing a model like this would be an A-B split test. Uh, and there's tons of frameworks out there that a company that was doing this would probably go leverage um, if they were trying to paint that dynamically. Another way might be to, uh, if there's an API call that happens behind the scenes, they could change those out. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, one of the, the best e-commerce data science teams I've seen to date is the Staples team. Uh, and they are responsible for the entire recommendation pipeline for staples.com. They actually literally built um, everything end-to-end. Uh, -end, and they, 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 the way they interface with their organization is through an API call. And so they run tests on the back end, not even exposing that to like the, the enterprise team that manages the website by just deciding, hey, for this set of traffic coming in or this request, we're going to send these results, and we're going to measure, measure the output that way. Um, it, again, it's just going to vary by what you have available. But in most cases, for e-commerce, it's going to be A-B split tests, and you're probably going to measure conversion rate uplift. Um, any questions on that? Cool. Um, so I put this in here just as a kind of thought piece uh, before we kind of get into some of the technical aspects about recommendation engines, um, mainly because you, when you're thinking about particularly from a product manager standpoint, you're going to bring a new model to your team. You're going to say, I think that 
instead of paying, you know, if you're the PDF company, instead of paying 100 people to go mine and extract uh, this information from PDFs, I think we can repurpose those dollars in a scale of fashion in this model. In the online world, recommendation engines have had a long history of tension between merchants and the technical teams. Um, typically, just because the if you think about the the strategy for a retailer, merchants have always driven the top-down um, recommendation of products in the very broadest sense. Merchants literally decide what they think the market wants. They go out, they spend you know uh, the retailer's money to buy goods six to eight months in advance. Um, and so it, it, it's interesting to see like over the the, uh, the 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 teams that I've worked with how they've actually had to overcome some of the political aspects about rolling out recommendation engines. Uh, one of my good friends from Dallas used to uh, run the analytics team for a large uh, apparel retailer there. And they went as so as far as uh, having to actually build in tools to let the merchants understand why the algorithm did made the recommendation it did because somebody was really mad that they put the Chanel something next to whatever else and that's not on brand. But at scale, it makes much more sense for uh, a machine to make these smaller recommendations uh, than it does for a merchant to try and uh, optimize down to you know uh, one to one or even something in between that, right? So one of the first things we're going to talk about in recommendation, or really just uh, this is both recommendation and search. Anytime you're trying to uh, uh, show someone anything from a, 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 a dynamic standpoint, there's kind of two processes. The first is what I call candidate selection. So imagine a world where Someone comes to your website and enters a large screen laptop for gaming. Um, and they have a known affinity for design centric. Maybe they've got a couple of past purchases of I don't know, things that are marked more Apple-ish than say uh, Lenovo, for example, right? Um, one of the first things that you can do is just by having better structured data, you can reduce a lot of noise in your pipeline. So the, uh, that's kind of where we typically focus on an edge case. So a lot of, a lot of times, Imagine a world where you're trying to write a, um, a, a, a interpreter for the word large screen and gaming. And at some point, if you don't actually know that large screen means that you should have laptops that, are, that match those larger screens or what the concept of larger screen is, like that a large screen is 17 inches and a small one is 13 inches, um, you don't, you're going to start off with a bunch of much more noise uh, in your model. Uh, and so a lot of cases we help educate customers and just kind of the market in general of you can go a long way just by doing a lot more data enrichment up front uh, by structuring information in like, a, in like a search engine or in this case a recommendation engine even before you get to anything that's personalized or recommended. Um, and then once you have your set of stuff, you then want to go rank it. Uh, and so we're going to walk through that pipeline here in a second. But in most cases, you're kind of you're out of the box or uh, ordinary recommendation engine is going to follow these two pieces. Same thing with search, honestly. Um, personalized search engines are really nothing more than a um, uh, repurposed recommendation engine. So the problem we're going to pose is that we want to predict a product affinity. So we know that user A liked uh, gave you know four and a half stars to these are the two products. Uh, we want to predict what would the um, what's the likelihood that this person uh, what's the rating this person might give for product U. Um, and so the way we're going to frame this as kind of a classical, if you've ever heard the word collaborative filtering, has anyone heard that word in here? Excellent. Um, is you, you're going to use the wisdom of the crowd. You're going to use the latent information inherent in other people's choices um, to help understand what this particular user should, should, uh, should also have. Uh, in most cases, you represent this by um, a user to product affinity matrix. So imagine a very large matrix, like so like uh, you have one, one uh, axis is your, all the users you have in your database, and the other axis is all the products you have in your database. And you're going to go fill in the, the known affinities you have. So the, the users that actually have said that I gave this particular product a five star rating, and I gave this one a three star rating. Um, you know, as so, as such, and as such. The problem, of course, as you can imagine, is that this matrix is very, very sparse, right? Uh, in most cases, in practice, you're you're trying to to, to under you're trying to predict the whole set of values with maybe less than 0.01 percent of the data. Um, in practice, also, you probably wouldn't do this with the entire product set. So, for example, if you're Staples, you're not going to go build a recommendation engine for all three million products. Your your matrix is not going to be three million by you know, 20 million people per month, you're probably going to build them by categories. 
But even for large sites, like a category like laptops for staples can still be a very, very large matrix. And they, they probably they probably run spark they probably run something similar to what I'm about to show you, at least as a starting point to get some of the um, some of the stuff they work with later. Um, so the question is, how can we predict uh, someone's rating given we only have a very small portion of the data? Um, so the the abstraction we're going to use uh, is uh, is essentially we're going to approximate that large matrix Q with two smaller matrices. Um, and so the and this is kind of uh, this is called a, a latent factor model. And if you think about this, what we're really doing is we're saying that we think that this large matrix, even though we can't see it, uh, is a projection of two smaller matrices that are represented uh, in some kind of smaller preference space. So literally, these two uh, matrices are going to be one's going to be x, which is going to be our user matrix. So what is the if I think of all the users that I have, uh, I'm going to represent those users in a um, you know uh, n by r matrix matrix where the the actual columns of this matrix are going to be uh, factors that might uh, that a user might have in common. Uh, so for example, I think a professor was was saying at another talk, uh, maybe this is going to be the the Nicolas Cage factor, or maybe it's going to be the how much Tom Hanks is in like a, a movie, for example, right? Um, and the same thing is going to happen on the item 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 uh, factor matrix, where you know the it's going to be uh, y number uh, 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 p products wide, and it's going to be uh, of rank r. And so that that r is really just saying that we think that you can represent all the information in this large matrix uh, by a smaller approximation. Uh, and it turns out there's a very simple method for doing this. There's, there's a variety of matrix approximation methods out there. Uh, the one that we're going to run because it's just really easily available in Spark is uh, called alternating least squares. Um, and, you, and you can go look online if you want to see the math behind it. Um, you know, it's you know, obviously it's not not that exciting. Uh, but what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take the the raw information we have. So we have uh, again, this is coming from Movie Lens, which is uh, really just a uh, a uh, kind of a, a public project put on by I think it's the University of uh, Minnesota. I want to say, I may get that wrong, but they have a project they've run for the past 15 years. Uh, people can come in and talk uh, movielens.org, and it's like uh, your own personalized Netflix recommendations. And what they do with the data is they make it available, anonymized, obviously, so you're not passing your information out to the world at large. So data scientists and uh, folks that want to do research on recommendation engines can uh, continue that craft. Uh, the data on the right is pretty straightforward. It's a very large CSV, I think maybe half a gig or something like that. Um, there's like 20 million ratings, I think, in this data set. Um, and you can do take smaller chunks if you want. Uh, I'm not going to train the model. Well, actually, I'm not going to train anything because I don't have, I can't get my machine. But I think uh, training this at 20 million for just a single four cores, I think maybe 30 minutes at most, um, just makes you crank up the uh, the the, um, the heap size because it does get pretty big in that case. Um, and so work we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of things. So we're going to jump to some code. So first and foremost, again, this is all uh, Scala and Spark code. So if you are not not familiar with Scala, um, this would be a good introduction. Um, so first, we're going to take the ratings. Uh, so in, uh, in, uh, in, in Spark, we're going to uh, use a, a library called uh, Spark CSV, which is uh, Databricks' uh, uh, module for parsing CSVs. Um, we're going to take the raw CSV and we're going to convert it into a rating object. Uh, and then to build our model, we need to do two things. So the uh, um, alternating least squares model has a couple of free parameters called hyperparameters that we need to figure out what we want. So one of them is uh, the rank of the matrix. So if you go back to um, this abstraction, we need to figure out how how many how many how much R do we want to have? Do we want to have five latent factors, ten latent factors, twenty latent factors, um, and then you know how many iterations do you want to train this model for? And then the other parameter is a, a lambda function or lambda parameter, which is the regularization regularization parameter, which is basically a fancy term for saying how much do you want to not overfit the data? Because uh, what you're doing in this case is you're training two matrices to kind of proc to, to approximate what you've seen. And you don't want it, to, and you want to make it as generalized as possible. And so, what you'll typically do is you'll have a, a lambda variable that you're going to go train and see. Um, you're going to tune up and down, right? It might be 0.1 in one scenario, it might be 0.5 in another. Um, honestly, it just varies by your data. And so, what you do from a machine learning standpoint is you call it's called a 
validation, right? Or you're trying to tune your hyperparameters. So what I would do here is I would take this uh, sample function. Again, I have this talk online, too, if you guys want to see the sample code. Uh, so you don't have to squint or, or, or dive into it. But something like this, where you're trying to provide a, a sample rank, a lambda, and like a number iteration starting point. And then what we're using for the, uh, the fit function, or to know if we've actually approximated how well the, the matrix has approximated our data, uh, is uh, something called um, uh, root mean square error, uh, which is just basically saying that we're going to take each of the, uh, the we're going to approximate this matrix, and then I'm going to go take the, uh, the data that I haven't seen, and I want to see how well the, uh, the model can predict the, uh, the data I haven't seen. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a simple function for you take the, uh, uh, what the, the square of like the, uh, the, the difference of like the, the actual value in the prediction, uh, and I think you, you sum them together and take the mean, essentially. Um, again, you can see the source code on, on online if you want to take a look at it. Uh, but what you'll do is you'll run that for a couple of different scenarios. So here's the output for uh, different values for lambda and rank and um, et cetera, et cetera. And I just find the best fitting one. So the best fitting one is it gives an RMS of a, you know 0.665 or whatever, which is fine. Because um, in this case, I'm not too much interested in getting it really precise because I I want to use it for online predictions, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but then you would train the model and you would save it somewhere because we're gonna we're gonna pull it up later. I'll stop there. Questions? Okay. So um, let's say that you wanted to build a recommendation experience. So again, you're this product manager for a product page on an e-commerce site. And what you want to do is you want to say that when someone navigates to, I don't know, Con Air uh, online, uh, what are the best movies to show that person that are related to that film? And so, you know, if you were a merchant, you know, that was thinking about that movie, you're, you would, you know, in your mind you have your set of things that you might go recommend to somebody. But what if you wanted an algorithm to go do it better? Uh, so in this case, uh, I just have some sample code here I'll walk through about uh, a couple things you have to do. So uh, one of the first things is that the, um, the uh, ALS algorithm creates two different uh, matrices, right? So that, like we talked about, there's the item factor matrix and the user factor matrix, which is um, just going to be very long uh, uh, rectangular matrices of uh, the users and like each vector in that, uh, that matrix is going to be the rank representation of that user, and each uh, matrix in the item vector is going to be each uh, uh, rank representation of that, of that uh, matrix or that that movie in the uh, the item factor matrix. Um, what you can do, and th what the source code essentially does, is it says that uh, you can just take that that matrix for the items, which is going to be you know n number of items by r, uh, and you can just cluster them. You can actually find similar movies to any number item in that matrix just by doing a simple um, similarity metric. Uh, in this case, I use cosine uh, similarity. You could use uh, you know, uh, Euclidean distance or whatever else you want, uh, but cosine works just fine. Uh, and what this spits out at the end is just a rank set of films that are related to the movie Con Air, or whatever you pick. Um, so in this case, you see it's finding things like Con Air number one. That's good. That means that you didn't mess up your algorithm. Uh, I would expect that a cosine of like the movie with itself should be one. Uh, and then just going down, you see movies that it recommends. So things like Bad Boys make a lot of sense. Striking Distance actually comes up, which I think is interesting. The Rock, another like Nicolas Cage uh, uh, classic. Um, and it kind of goes on from there. So kind of going back to the first part I talked about, uh, the, the two pieces of recommendations, uh, candidate selection. You could start with this. Uh, so one of the problems that comes up a lot in recommendation engines is that if you you don't have a start, it's called the cold start problem. Like I don't know what to, to, to recommend to you because I don't know what you care about. Um, I don't know what's different from you than somebody else. In a lot of cases, you can seed your starting point or your cold start position with the selection of items for, say, that product page you're going to come to with something like this. Uh, if you had a bunch of features for the movie, say, like uh, what genre it's in or what care keywords it might be in, you could also do that. That's also a good, good approach as well. Um, this works just fine. I mean, if you're going to go take this tomorrow and try to build your own recommendation engine, it's totally fine to do that with your, your latent item factors. Uh, but we're going to start with this list of 20 films. And then what we want to do is you want to say, I want to now recommend the, the right order of these based upon what I know about you. Um, in particular, ideally, what I learn about you in real time. And so, like I said, there's kind of two approaches to this. Um, uh, there's an online way to do this and an offline way to do this. Um, by offline, what I mean is that if you if you came to the website and you browsed around a couple different pages, um, I would generate some sample data. I would say you went to this movie, you went to this movie uh, page, you went to this movie page, this movie page. It might be represented by product IDs. 
um, if I had time to go rebuild a model, to so take that your data, that would be the same data as if I was building the um, the original model from, and I would recalculate the uh, the uh, affinity matrix. Um, and all that does is that get that basically lets you lets lets the model retrain the entire set with the knowledge that there's some new user that's stuck in there that might throw off the model or have some new signal uh, to learn essentially. Uh, but let's say that you don't have that luxury. You want to make real-time recommendations, so real-time personalization is a big-time buzzword. Um, how could we take the same assets we generate uh, from the ALS model and then use that in real time to kind of rank the results that uh, our initial uh, starting point had? Um, so what we do is the so in the in the off in like the offline model, the PU is just basically the uh, the actual ratings that someone has. And so if you think about your your ratings you might give to a movie. If, if you know how you go to uh, Netflix or back in the day, they used to ask you about how would you rate this film, or they want to they want you to seed that kind of algorithm with uh, some ratings so they can better tailor to you. Um, you know your PU from that case is going to be your preferences uh, for your particular or your stance. And what what you want to know is what are the the movies that I haven't seen, so I can then rank those uh, the items that I that I have. Uh, in like the classic case, I would just go take the the known PUs and like recalculate the whole affinity matrix. In the, this case, I need to approximate the uh, the PU with uh, something that I that um, that I don't know about. And so what I'm trying to do here is I I don't I'm, I have these two these two values, and what I really want to do is predict um, what is this vector, uh, because if I can predict this latent vector, I can then go calculate the whole list essentially. Uh, and so there's actually a straightforward uh, linear algebra way to do that. Actually, we'll get to that, that in a second. Um, so the, the data set we're going to work with here is, again, imagine that you're browsing an e-commerce website. Um, and one of the things you might do is you're looking at Nicolas Cage on the site. You go to a few films. Um, and you seed that, uh, that initial recommendation when you get on that page with the history you just had. And the challenge is that you, know, you, 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 don't, you, know, you, don't, you can't have time to go back and reprocess the entire ALS model uh, with that information. So can I? Can I seed or start that kind of a, that that preference matrix or that preference vector with a, a few what I might know? And so the trick that we use here, um, and actually it's it's a trick that a lot of folks in um, e-commerce use, is what's a, is a, a metric called dwell time or product dwell time, uh, which is how long do you stand on this sit on this page or dwell on this product page before you go to another page, um, and you use it as a signal of uh, intent. So in this case, I might be if I dwelled on 60 seconds longer than I did rock and Lord of War is somewhere in between, um, that should, in theory, inform what films or what concepts I might be more receptive to um, in that low rank approximation when I get to Con Air, whatever it is. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one thing you could do is you could also, uh, you, could, you could have like a, uh, uh, what's the with the word? Um, a, uh, uh, you could you could uh, have a, a function that reduces the impact here, right? So could, what, what I'm about to do with these these ranks here is I'm going to put them into a an array and then use that to go find a, a ranking function. I could tune that however I want. I could because there's gonna, there's just real valued numbers, right? I could go say that I think that um, there's a, a loss of interest over time, right? Or the one closest to the movie is uh, that I want to want to show or whatever the the product is is going to have the most impact, right? Uh, you might have a, a bell curve, right? Maybe the first one you go to is actually more important, and then you have some other characteristic that that triggers some other piece there, right? Um, I mean, that's kind of where, as you think about um, improving a model, for example. So we didn't talk today about uh, kind of best practices for the kind of prioritizing data science, but one one thing you might do as a data scientist that was assigned to a this recommendation engine is you might say, actually, I think it's a better function for X, and I want to go try this function and see if it works, basically, right? And then you would go through that process and put it online. Um, but great question, though. Well, the other thing, too, is that um, uh, we uh, we built this model from review information, uh, which is 1 to 5. And um, in the I think the code, I, I used uh, a version of uh, ALS from Spark that uh, assumes that you have a, a both a positive and negative training samples. Uh, when you do something like dwell time, there is no negative signal. You can't. There's no negative sing signal to the the model, and so there's a derivation that lets you do uh, that's more oriented around dwell times. Things that have like just uh, uh, non-negative uh, values, for example. I forget what it's called, but it's it's in the the, the source. It's in the SDK. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, this again, I couldn't show, but this 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 code right here. Generates this list of films that are related. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, you know, it, it's all based on, in theory, what people like you have also liked. So it probably tells us that their, the original was not that great, or at least in the folks that rated movies similar or highly rated or similar to Con Air um, didn't like the original, right? Uh, and what's interesting about graph models is that they they have this inherent kind of um, implicitness, right? Like so it's kind of it's by nature how it works. You're you're saying that I, I'm 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 defining similarity by other folks that are similar to me that like similar films, and so it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, another thing you might do so the, some of the more modern modern approaches to recommendations are much more uh, supervised. So uh, by that I mean you will you have a more direct model of these features go into this outcome versus what, I, what this is more what we call unsupervised where you're trying to create some structure in like a, a data set and then interpret it basically, right? Um, so the trick I do here uh, to get to, uh, uh, basically I want to approximate x of u. Is this a, I use the identity property uh, in this formulation. And the math is not important. Um, it's just that I can get to a very, I can get to a, a place where I can just take the the matrix that I generate or like the values that I generate from uh, your browsing behavior um, and I can use that to uh, so I can this PU that the that PU is literally uh, those those values right so this might be five and that might be three and that might be or two and that might be three um, I'm gonna wait that 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 PU that I'm gonna plug into like the uh, that formulation to get this XU that I don't know because I want to take that XU and I want to then multiply that by the the uh, item trans uh, item transpose to get the full unknown values. So that's going to do in this code right here. And again, you know, you can look at the source code online. Um, I generate uh, an array of preferred movies, and I'll show you two examples in the next in the next slide. Um, I generate or I create a a, a G matrix that's just like a takes that uh, that transform function right here. Uh, and then I basically generate the uh, XU by multiplying across uh, um, by that uh, that preferred movies uh, movies matrix. Um, and at the end of that, I go and I say, well, what did what did I then rank the movies that come out of it? Um, so here's just two examples. Uh, so again, keeping that in mind that there's a list of 20 films that are all predisposed to say, hey, these 20 films are related to uh, Con Air in some way. And what I want to do now is I want to pick the top three, or in this case, two films that are um, related to, or most likely related to the things that the person browsing in real time might want. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just putting down these, these, these ranks. And so, again, I don't want to go over there. Uh, so on the left side, there's a taste profile for Lord of War is my jam. So like I spent a ton of time on Lord of War, um, and uh, The Rock got some love, but Gone was not that great. Uh, so the things that it recommends are actually more actually oriented. Um, so you can see that The Rock and Lord of War got influenced. But then the bottom one, let's say that you said that, you know, Nash Treasure was a really great film. It's biased, or that's, that's a different conversation. Um, but what you enjoyed about Nash Treasure was the, uh, the, com the comedic aspect about it, right? The, um, the slapstick aspect about it, right? And so if you have a, a, a weight stronger in that direction, uh, the system recommends something like Blue Streak, uh, Martin Lawrence film that's still cop-oriented, um, still funny, but you know, in the same vein of like the humorous side of Con Air. Um, I thought it was funny in both cases it recommended Assassins, which apparently I have to go see, so I have to solve that at some point. Any questions on that? Okay, I think I have just a little bit left here. Um, so yeah, I want to talk a little bit about how do we improve that. Um, so again, we kind of made this, this uh, affinity matrix, U and P, uh, and it was two dimensions. Uh, but if anyone remember the Netflix prize, uh, that, that, whole, that whole scenario, uh, the winning people from that group actually included a dimension of time. Um, I think the algorithm they, they came up with was called Time SVD or something like that. Uh, but all they did was they realized that people's preference for movies is not static. So you, you know, the order in which you rate things is not a is not is actually really relevant to predicting the uh, the likelihood of your next movie prediction. And so if you think about that matrix, just kind of another dimension, uh, you can you know I, I don't I don't know the, uh, the the derivation for their algorithm, but you could have another alternating approach where you do kind of three different pieces of that. Um, Another approach is actually collapsing. Uh, so in a lot of cases, because this matrix is so sparse, when you get to very large uh, catalogs, um, so like a Amazon scale, where you know 
the long tail of products you see, not a lot of folks visit them, and let alone purchase them. And so you, you might have a lot of good signal at the, at the higher end. We have a lot of data. But if you get farther out into films that just don't have enough signal to kind of correlate that, that person's behavior to the other part of the, uh, the data set, uh, you can shorten that. So one of the tricks is, uh, again, when thinking from an edge case standpoint, you could take all the products that you have and collapse them into different uh, features. So instead of um, you know, all like the, the columns being every single movie, you could say, let me just stack up all the action films, all the horror films, all the whatever the different vectors you want to do. And if you collapse that matrix, you get a stronger signal when you want to go approximate. So I'm just trying tricks of the trade. Excellent. And that's it. Um, if you guys have more questions, I'm uh, Garrett at dataexhaust.io. Um, I do a little bit of consulting as well. Uh, if you guys have questions around that, uh, product team training. I talk to a lot of product teams um, and products or CPOs about helping them with same same kind of questions we talked about today. Um, or if you just want to grab a beer and have more support, you're just struggling with uh, you know some something in your in your business. Uh, I'm always happy to give beer advice. And that's it. Yeah, they're available online. I'm just a slides.com slash data exhaust. Uh, and then my blog is dataexhaust.io. has a, a long blog post about this. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you.